George Lang immigrated from Scotland and brought 610 acres of land around Langholm from his stepfather and brother in the early 1850s. He married Jane Somerville in 1856 and together they raised a large family. They built a house near the beach calling it Rose Neath and farmed the land until the 1920s. They kept sheep, hens, turkeys and beehives for honey. My wife was a Lang and her family owned the Lang farm way back in the century before last. The, the first person was a man called Duff Lang and he left New Zealand and went to Australia and made a lot of money in the gold fields, enough to buy all the land that is Langholm from their Victorian gold fields. And um, that was in 1860s, I think 1862, he, and he came back in 1865 and bought the, the farm which was to become the, the become Lang, known as Langholm. At that time it was known as Little Muddy Creek. Rosny soon became much more than a family home. It served as a part-time school, post office or local shop. After James Lang's death in 1921, the land was subdivided into 474 sections. You could buy a section on a steep hill for £25 or a beach frontage for £250. The new owners often lived in a tent until they could build a house. Sometimes a possum would run up one of the tent poles and down the other. Nobody slept well in those nights. I really like the story of Grandma Lang's lamp. Um, it's been in the roundabout and it was in the roundabout recipe book that was produced for the 21st anniversary of the roundabout magazine. Back, way back, um, it was very dark in Langholm because there were no street lights. And if somebody went out in a boat onto the harbour, they may not have been able to find their way back into Langholm Bay once it got dark. So Grandma Lang, Lang used to put a lamp in a window of the homestead. Now the homestead was behind roughly where the store is now. Was the store there then? I don't think there was a shop then because there were very few people living in Langham. It was a farm with a few farm workers and that was all. So she would put the lamp in a window and that lamp could be seen from way out in the harbour. And there was, a, I think it was the father and son who were out there in a boat one day and they didn't manage to get back home before it was dark and I think it got a bit misty as well and they spotted Grandma Lang's lamp and they used the lamp to guide them back into the bay. So the lamp's kind of like a lighthouse? Like a mini lighthouse. That's yeah really that's cool. a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah it's really cool. name? Well, um, the Lang family had owned a lot of land in the area um, for a long time and then in the late 1920s um, they sold it so some developers um, came and they named the estate 
um, that they were selling, all the sections in the subdivision, they called Lang Home Estate. So Lang for the Lang family, and home meaning a kind of low-lying land near a river. Brooklyn School was built in Parau in 1894. Edward Hatch was a pupil there in 1931. Edward and his friends walked to school from Langholm following a bush truck from what is now Victory Road to Parau Bridge. On the way home, the children liked to crawl through the water pipes by the stream. Another pastime was playing with the controls of the old bush locomotive that still stood on its rails below the bridge. Brooklyn School was built in eight, around 1894, um, which means that there's been a school in Langholm for about 130 years. What can you tell us about the school? It, it was on land that was donated by locals. It, it was on about two acres of land. There was a steep path going up to it. It was just a little one-roomed uh, school. It had a potbelly stove in it, had big windows. Um, an ex-student remembers um, having hot cocoa there. A couple of pupils really remember the end-of-year party at Cornwallis where they would go and they'd have things like lolly scramble, um, three-legged races, and they would have strawberries and ice cream, which was a real big treat back then. As children, we loved to catch tadpoles in the ponds where Langfield Terrace is now. We put them in a fish tank and added rocks for the baby frogs to climb on. When they grew too big for the tank, Mum would drive us to Parau Dam, where we would release them in the reeds for a long and happy life. So when did Langholm get its first primary school? Well, what happened in 1947 is um, an old army barracks um, was shifted to Langholm. Um, and it was actually shifted to the site of what's Langholm Play Centre now. Oh. And it was put up in one day and they had church service in it the next day. But it wasn't until... Um, the last term of 1950 that it began to be used as a school and so it was basically a two room school with a curtain down the middle um, and the juniors had the pot belly stove on their side and the seniors were on the other side. It only really operated for a few years um, and then the new school opened but it c continued to be used as a hall. We used to take bus tracks down the hill to get to the beach. There was a public phone there and we would tap it to phone home for a lift without paying. Who wants to walk home after a day at the beach? We did it by tapping the numbers out in the receiver rest. When I told Mum, she says, I don't think that sounds legal, love. So when was the present day school opened? So Langholm Primary, that you're at today yep. um, was opened in May 1953 so the old hall was used up until that point. Oh. Um, at that time it had four classrooms. Oh, cool. um, the, the headmaster was a man called Mr McAllister. Um, he lived in a house, in a schoolhouse across the road. So how many students were there back in the 1950s? By the late 1950s, there were about 80 to 90 students at eight, the school. 80 to 90. How many are there today? 300, about. Uh huh. 300. Great. Did you go to Langholm Primary School as a child? Um, yes, I started Langholm Primary School in 1953, just before it moved over the road here. I first started, the school was in the hall across the road, and there were two classrooms with a curtain between them the juniors and the seniors. And then the new school opened in, uh, later in 1953 and I came across the road to the new school, which is now the old block. <laughs> I used to catch the school bus and eventually, when I was a little bit older, we got a bicycle and we used to ride to school. We used to challenge ourselves to see if we could ride all the way up from the beach to the top of the hill without having to get off. 
did you eventually do it? Yes, I did. I got, I got quite good at it and I got really fit riding to school. What did you have for lunch? Well, always we had lunch in uh, came wrapped in grease poof paper um, with a little rubber band to hold it together and inside was always a sandwich with marmite and lettuce. Would you like it? Hmm. No, I didn't either very much and sometimes when I complained enough mum would give me peanut butter and lettuce instead. Um, but um, so that and usually we had a piece of fruit and apple so that's what we had for lunch most of the time. Have you got involved in any local events? Yes well Langham in those days was quite social and there were um, lots of things going on. They had movies at the Langham Beach Hall every once a week and we used to go down and all the children would sit at the front of the movie hall on mattresses and the parents and adults were sitting on yeah. chairs through the back. The real the film came on wouldn't last the whole of the movie so halfway through they had to turn it off and change all the film over and then start it up again so you saw half a movie then it stopped then you saw the other half we would sort of have the people in the hall there the, the children watching particularly the cowboys galloping across the stream and then suddenly there'd be a <laughs> as the as the film melted in the middle Really? And, and the two bits weren't. And then the kids would all stamp their feet and then they'd get up and come and uh, buy... Because we sold olives and, and, um, and uh, I think we sold also ginger beer at the time. Sandy McAdam lived on a houseboat at Langholm Beach in the 1920s. He was a big man who loved birds and often had a cockatoo on his shoulder. He owned a large orchard and the local children loved to steal his apples when he went to see his missus who lived in Idlewild. The house still stands at 15 Sandy's Parade. It was built on the foundations of the Lang Farm Sharing Shed. Sandy McAdam I got to meet when he lived in his house on the beach. I would ride my bike from Victory Road, uh, where my parents lived, um, down to the beach. I would leave my bike um, at Sandy's house, pick up my oars and outboard, and get out in my boat and have fun. Little Muddy Creek was my domain. I used to love it. Um, I would go right up to the end of the creek as far as you could possibly go and then I would go in and out of the mangrove bushes. Okay. Sometimes I would fish um, but not always. I was more of an explorer and as a 12 year old, 12 year old that was absolutely fantastic because I loved exploring. <laughs> I used to be a steward at the annual Langholm Raft Race because I had a boat. Each year I took up a position out in Langholm Bay and watched the stingrays nimbly swim between the children's legs while they pushed out their rafts. No one ever got hurt by them, in fact I could only actually see them because I was standing up. by the tide, a large sperm whale was left stranded near Langholm in February 1953. It was about 15 metres long and about 35 tonnes. Its skin was badly scarred from crossing the bar at Monaco Heads. It was believed to be the first time such a large whale had entered the Monaco Harbour. 
there wasn't TV until the 1950s, so people liked to go out and, and gather and get together. So there were, um, in the area, there were beach hall dances, there was a, a big Guy Fawkes um, bonfire every year. So one um, really interesting thing that happened back in the day was that there, twice a year there would be concerts um, held, which involved um, most of the people in the community. So if they could play an instrument or, or sing or be involved in a play, um, they'd all get involved. Mrs Penman used to organise concerts. Um, some of the concerts were for her pupils, uh, but some were more for the Langholm community. And so um, I got to sing um, in Langholm Hall. And I remember singing, um, particularly Send in the Clowns. We had this musical in the local village hall. We had the fire brigade sat at the back of the hall. We had all of this singing and stuff of songs that were popular at the time and before. Somebody came on and took a picture and with flash powder, you know, mm -hmm. which was great, except the flash powder I, I had made up wrongly. So it, it produced a flash all right, but it produced clouds and clouds of smoke that went up above the, the cast and then started to coming down again. So we're coughing and choking there, trying to get off stage, and they, all the audience can see is our legs <laughs> walking around under this big smoke cloud. You, you'd be like, no, it's part of the show, we can continue. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, the show must go on. Yeah, did the fiber go do anything about it? Oh, yes, they sang. They kept singing. <laughs> <laughs> Very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, so that sounds... Very, very, very strange. All the time he's all gone lazy, but it seems that he thinks that he's crazy. And the folks all call him Brad, and he's like, I am good. Then come and take me to the cavalry. How was life different in those days? We, we, didn't, we didn't have a lot of things in our home that you have these days. Like in our home at the start, we had didn't have an oven to cook with. We didn't have a bathroom. We didn't have phone. We didn't have um, TV. We did have a radio. And we didn't have a washing machine. And we didn't have um, a vacuum cleaner. So everything had to be done by hand. And mum spent most of her day keeping the house clean and tidy. What things did Langholm have then that we don't have now? What did they have then? Langholm had um, four shops. There were two post offices in Langholm. Um, one down at the beach in, in the shop that's down there and one in the shop up in Langholm Central. Um, up, we called Langholm Central in those days which was the top of the hill up here where the school is. And here is some postmarks from the Langholm School for, and that, that post office was open from 1935 till 1988 and the Langholm Central one there are some postmarks from that and it was open from 1951 to 1975. Did you ever do any errands for your mum when you were a child? Yes I can remember when I was about seven or eight I'd be sent down to the dairy with a 20 cent piece to buy the Sunday loaf which was a special loaf they made just on Sundays Mm. had no wrapping <laughs> just and not cut and um, so that would cost 18 cents and with the two cents left over I was allowed to buy lollies and I, at the time you could get five lollies for a cent so you'd get a bag of ten lollies which I'd eat on the way home Did you get involved in any special school events or outings? Yes, I've got a lot of photographs there of um, school events we had um, things like Wacky Wednesday and Crazy Hair Day, and um, we dressed up as characters for, from books. This one is a photograph of my children that I had in room four for the year one children. They were new entrants. And this one was my retirement when I, from Paul Heff, the headmaster, when he gave me that. Uh, as a fun thing. 
they also presented me with this lovely shirt with all sorts of people's names on it. I've never worn it because it's too precious for me. Can you tell us about this book? This is a book that was presented to me when I retired and it's got, I think, probably all of the people, children and teachers who were at school with me. This picture on the front is me feeding the hens because I used to take buckets around to all the classrooms and collect the lunches that they people didn't eat and take them home and that was part of the um, hen's food. What kind of kapahaka performances have you organised with children at this school? One of the ones we used to do was a matariki breakfast oh, yeah. where kapahaka would open the ceremony, we would decorate the hall have a little cave that was lit up with fairy lights that people would be called through uh, to come into the hall and the kapahaka would perform and then we would all sit down and have a big feed before the parents went off to work. How does te reo Māori fit within the school curriculum? The language is an important way of learning a culture uh, and even to be able to hear a language and recognise what language is being spoken is, is a, a very important step. When I first arrived at this school, there wasn't much um, Maori language being spoken. Well, there really wasn't any. Um, and we have since introduced programs where it's now become such a valuable part of the curriculum at the school. For as a caterer uh, involved with the school, I've um, cooked special occasions for the teachers and when there are parent interviews, I used to um, cook the teachers' dinner. Uh, I did the school camps. We were on Motutapu Island and we'd been there, for, we'd gone for a week. And so I made this big pot of chicken soup, put it, boiled it up and turned it off to let the fat settle on the top of it. I went out of the room for about three minutes, came back, heard all this splashing, and here in my pot of soup was the sparrow swimming, trying to get out from all the fat. So we got the sparrow out, washed him, scooped off all the fat, boiled the soup for an hour so it was really well boiled and served it for lunch because on Motutapu Island there are no shops so the, but one of the mothers found out told the parents no parents will eat the soup but the kids did such as carnivals or sporting occasions? 25 years ago we had the 50 year jubilee for the school and I was um, on the committee for that and I helped with uh, a lot of the activities and that was a bit of a disaster because a cyclone came and up on the top court we had a marquee and the water was running through the marquee and blowing all the walls, but we still managed to celebrate 50 years of Langholm School. There was also a school fair that we had, and another cyclone came. Where um, the hall is now, there was a big grassed area, and they had this horse that was giving horse rides. This poor horse was there for three hours giving rides in pouring rain. It was all muddy, but the kids were having fun, and the horse walked all day round and round in circles to give rides. In the 1980s, all the roads in Langholm, except Victory Road, were gravel. Carry Point used to have the peanut truck come around in the summer. It would spray the peanut oil on the road to keep the dust down. If you got stuck behind it, there is no way you can overtake it. 
At least your car didn't get dusty. Do your children go to Langholm Primary? Yes, they did. Yes, they both did. Okay. Um, and can you remember some of the special moments dur- during their um, primary school years? Wow. One moment that stands out in particular mm. was um, we used to have a competition for littlest lunches. And Ooh. I don't know if you'd still do that now. And they'd look at everybody's lunchbox and the class that had the least amount of litter for the week and like packaging in their yeah. lunches won a prize. And um, one time my son's class won for that week. They had the least amount of litter. And the prize was to have a water fight with Mr. Heff, who was the principal at the time. Oh, I'm pretty sure I remember I've heard of him. Yes, and Pat, my son, was just so beside himself with excitement. It was the best thing ever. And he says, Mr. Heff walked in and he had two of those huge big water guns and all around his waist was the uh, balloons, the water balloons. Oh, yeah. Yes, and so they had a big water fight with Mr. Heff <laughs> as their prize. <laughs> Both of my boys went to Lancome Primary. Can you remember some of the special moments during the primary school years? I clearly remember Chris coming home one day. Um, He was in Miss Hardy's class at the time and they had a school trip to Howick Colonial Village and they had to dress up. So they had to dress up like they were in the 19th century. But when Chris came home, he was a bit upset. And he said, they tied my hand behind my back. And I thought, ah, you went into the classroom and they had a mock lesson and they wouldn't let you write with your left hand. And he said, yeah, that's right. And they tied his hand behind his back. Can you tell us about your role as a park ranger? Mm, Sure, my role as a park ranger involved several things. Firstly was um, looking after the forest and protecting the forest. Mm -hmm. Another big part of my role was looking after the people that came to visit the forest. And I had three specific roles. One was uh, fire control, putting out fires that were lit in the forest. Another one was search and rescue, looking for people that got lost in the forest. Mm -hmm. And the third one was called Compliance and Law Enforcement, which is about making sure people behave themselves when they're using the forest. When I was working on Guy Fawkes Night, I didn't enjoy it because I used to come across people that had um, illegal bonfires or they were letting fireworks off in the park, which was illegal. And I came across a group of men who had an illegal bonfire on the beach. So I parked my truck and I walked along to tell them that the fire was illegal and would have to be put out and one of them uh, got very angry with me and he started to chase me in his vehicle and try to run me over on the beach. So I I ran back to my truck and I locked myself in the truck and then he tried to let all my tyres down. So I'd I'd get in the truck and I'd shift the truck and he'd chase me and let some more tyres down and I'd move the vehicle again. And in the end I had to get the police to come and and arrest him because he was just being very naughty. Chief of Langham Fire Station? Well, it obviously, you know, it's to go to fires and motor accidents and medical calls and uh, things like that. For me as chief, that's actually only a small part of the uh, job because I've got to administer the brigade, I've got to make sure everything, all the equipment is right, uh, make sure training's being done, 
all these sorts of things so that when an emergency call comes in, the brigade and the members of it are ready to turn out and do a good job. How does the fire service deal with bushfires in the Waitakere's? The first thing is we turn out as many crews as we possibly can, and helicopters of course. So what we will do is the first fire engine arrives, usually there's two to any call like that, and then they'll call for assistance. So at that stage we know if it's a major bushfire, we're going to be fighting it for several days. Tell us a bit about the history of this fire. Sure, well this was our very first ever fire engine back in 1955 but before that it had been up in the Pacific Islands during World War II and it was an airport crash truck so that if a bomber came back and it had been shot up or something like that and crashed on the runway it and the other crash trucks would rush out and put the fire out and then they'd uh, get the crew out. But the war ended in 1945 and it came back to New Zealand and was sold and one of our very first members bought it actually because in those days the council ran the brigade and uh, it served us well until about 1969 and we got a newer fire engine and it went away. And we didn't hear much more about it until ooh, 25 odd years ago it must be now. Um, and we found it sitting on a farm up in Northland with blackberries growing through it and uh, really had it. So we gave them a little bit of money, we brought it back, we've been working on it ever since. It will still have a, uh, an active role in the future. Can you tell us a bit about these photos that are on the wall? So this is the first fire station being built. And you see this Victory Road curving round there, it was a gravel road in those days. There they are putting it up, feeling a bit proud of themselves in the second photo. The old bus shelter, see that there? That was there for years and it's been replaced by a more modern one in recent times. The next one down is the opening day of the station in uh, 1955. And you can see all the locals have come out to uh, have a look at it. And down the bottom is the opening day of this fire station and uh, that's the fire engine on the right that we uh, had in those days. So that's 1972 and it was a big jump up to go to this fire station after <laughs> that rickety old one. On the land where Langholm Kindergarten is today was an old settler's house where they stored hay for the horses. My friend had a pet ferret. We used to take it to hunt for mice amongst the broken down floorboards and broken down walls. The ferret found plenty, but we wouldn't let him catch them. They would just scurry away and hide under the hay. When did you and your family first move to Langholm? I was about six and my family moved here because my dad was the new headmaster oh. of what turned out to be the new school. They built us a new schoolhouse as well, so I didn't have far to walk. <laughs> So, um, so did you walk to school yes. every day? Oh, yes. Yeah. I lived just a few, uh, just a hundred metres that way. Okay, so and it was pretty quick. If we were outside, I can show you right now two, very, three or three very old high pine trees. And well, in the past, there were six of them. Really? So, so bouncy, you could jump from top of one tree to another. Really? Yeah, ten metres up, it was great fun. Could you describe like a typical day at school? Typical day at school, um, yes, the bell rang, we all had to line up, we generally say, yes, we sang every morning, and uh, God save the Queen, the Queen was new at the time, I remember an unusual event, lining up with all the rest of the school on the playground outside these four rooms here, and we were all given a coronation medal, because the Queen was crowned, and those medals are worth Quite a bit now. I moved to Langholm in 1969. So what were your first impressions of Langholm? First impressions were the narrow roads which were unsealed. It had the bush and it had the birds and it had the view of the harbour. 
and that's what we liked about out here. We have a right of way section and we had to do all the work to bring it into a, a nice area that was level in lots of different levels. So everything was delivered to the top of the drive and my husband built a four-wheeled wheelbarrow and every, or every bit of shingle, every bit of topsoil, every rock was brought down by hand and it's quite a 100, 100 metre section, it was a big job. We worked during the week in the city and the hot weekends were spent just getting the property in order. So, what brought you and your family to Langholm? Well, I'd come out to the job in Rotorua, it was a sort of a three-year contract. So at the end of that time, I was looking around for another job. And the Brickworks offered me a, a job here in New Lynn. So we came out to, to New Lynn and they wanted me to go and buy a nice red brick house in Green Bay. But neither my wife nor I really wanted to live in Green Bay. So we discovered Langholm and we found a house perched up on the side of the hill there. What we didn't realise was during the winter, well actually for most of the year, it didn't see any sunlight at all. Oh. And it was cold and damp and horrible and we all had coughs and colds. When we came to build our house, we had to, we, we, we bought a section across the road from, from this house on the hill. And um, obviously because it had the sunlight, it had a crumbly old batch on it that had secret panels in it because the, the man and the woman who'd lived there before, um, he used to work on the ship and he had all these mahogany panels and behind it was the parsnip wine that she used to make and the home brew that he used to make. Anyway, um, I lifted up the panel to see if there was any more sort of uh, parsnip wine there and there was a rat and he was so startled to see me he just sort of sat there and trembled. He'd never <laughs> seen a human being before. <laughs> so we had the job to demolish it. 